Three, two, one. What is happening, guys? This is Long Robinson from here. The Spear presented to you by NoelGameDay.com. We are here on a fantastic Thursday evening. And once again, we keep killing it with the guests this month. And we're going to probably head into July with some more. But to finish off the month of June, we've got former Noel Olympian now, now heading to World Championships in the 100 meters. Marvin Bracey with us. I've been looking forward to this one. I've had him been connected through twitter for a very long time and now getting him on the show i'm excited for this after just now qualifying for the 100 meter world championship which is going to start next month middle of next month marvin what's going on man happy to have you on here what's going on man i'm i'm thankful y'all got me i'm happy to be here absolutely nate you you know you and i are big track guys we like having track guys coming on to uh the football team so let, let's jump it all the way back a little bit here going back to fsu days you end up signing with florida state what was your recruitment like going into that because that was a very very special class not only did you come in into town with that but you came in also with Jameis winston you had mario edwards you had eddie goldman you, uh, you know you know you know darby real yeah, close yeah, too. yeah that was our roommate yeah, exactly. So what, what went into that recruitment? How did that go? Did the, anybody – who was in your ear maybe and getting you to FSU? So um, coming into – coming into my – well, before obviously before my freshman year, we all played in the um, – we all played in the Under Armour game together. So that's when I officially met Chris Casher, Mario Edwards, Jamie, uh, Jameis. Um, Darby was on the team. PJ was on the team. So – and that was when we still – that's it. Fowler was still committed to us. So we all mm-hmm. we all got to connect there. But um as for me, like the deciding factor really was um I was really close with a guy at the time. Well, I'm still close with him, Ricky Argro. And um he actually went to FSU. He triple jumped there like back in the past and we had built like a really good relationship. And at the time just everything about Florida State made sense. Like it was close to home. Um Track. The track team was really good. The football team was really good. Like everything just lined up. Because actually, fun fact, I almost went to I almost went to Texas A&M, but they um they fired the entire coaching staff, and I think uh, Mike Sherman was still a coach. And so, like I said, everything just all everything pointed towards Florida State. Yeah, I was gonna say the track play a big time part there because during that time, Florida mm-hmm. State and the track and field team was kicking, and they're doing it again right now as we speak. Right. But well, I'm wondering <laughs> if I'm wondering if track played a pretty big part in, in that recruitment there because you got a lot of hype. I mean, we're talking – I mean, Nate covered really heavily there at Scout that recruiting class for Florida State, and, you know, you were a big-time name just because primarily that speed that you would be bringing to somebody's offense. But I'm wondering if track played a huge part. Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, when I set out to go to college to play both, I let, you know, both track coach and football coach at every school know I wanted to do both. Like, I was, I was going to do both. And um, obviously the people that it came down to agreed to that. So for me, I also wanted to go where there's a good coach, you know, so that was good history. And at the time, I mean, Walter Dix is mm-hmm. one of the most famous track athletes of all time. And I mean, so why would I not want to follow, you know, in his footsteps or stuff like that? So it's like, you just kind of look at the coaching history and, you know, what they're currently doing. And, you know, obviously accolades matter. And so all of that just factored into me saying, you know what, FSU is the place for me. Good football, good track. And obviously, I mean, they ended up winning the national championship in football, so we saw that win. Mm-hmm. How was your relationship there with Jameis? I had a few people I was talking to this week. I was letting them know that I was, we we're going to have Marvin on this week. And a lot of them asked about Jameis, a few other players. But how are your relationships and friendships <laughs> inside the locker room and outside the field? How'd that go with a, a few of those guys? So... um Jameis is just one, he's really infectious as a person. Um, so I think that the very first day of like the Under Armour practice, like they just gather all the athletes in. There was like a big, there's like a huge game room, whatever, whatever. He comes in and like off the bat, like he's just loud and like er- he knew everybody, he had everybody, he commanded everybody's attention in the room. And mm-hmm. right then and there, like we knew like what type of person he was. Like it wasn't, it's like, like, that's how he, that's how he actually is. Like he really is a leader. So, you know, we, I had the pleasure of being on his team. And I think we won like 56 to 10. So I was mm-hmm. a happy man. Um, but we just saw how the man just came in, you know, and commanded a room amongst men who also want to command a room. So like he didn't put himself over anybody. So just dealing with that, dealing with him, like right then I knew what it was getting once we got to Florida State. 
and he just kind of carried that on, and we saw the success that he had. Yeah, I was wondering, too, I mean, also, you know, the recruiting tool of, of uh, Jimbo Fisher there, how was how was your relationship with, with Fisher? Um, obviously, now at Texas A&M doing his thing, but how was, it, how was Fisher as a coach for you on the football field? Um, as a coach, man, um, he's not for the week. <laughs> like, <laughs> listen, man, he's – He's yep. just not you. You got to have some thick skin like it's going like he's he's willing to mm. like pat you on the back, you know, as much as he is to, you know, let you know what you need to do better. But um, I mean, clearly he just he has the magic touch. The guy's getting it done, you know, wherever he goes. So, I mean, that just kind of you know says a lot about, you know, him as a coach and as a person. You know, going outside of now FSU, what made you kind of have that decision? Hey it might be time to go go pro and we see that a lot even for some guys in high school now you know mm -hmm. they have that speed you know they go ahead and get the chance depending on what kind of offers they get and who they sign with they'll take that right. jump what kind of went with you was it just after one of the times that you ran or what were you, what was your mindset in going and saying hey it's time to leave no nah, man so i'll take you back um going into the decision i'll take you back to like football i think like the very first day the very first day of camp the very first day I hurt my hamstring in one-on-ones and I kind of missed some time and I mean admittedly man the offense that he ran was nothing like what I've ever experienced ever in my life and at the time it was kind of hard to like process it so with me being behind injury wise and me not really learning the offense like that I came back like two weeks after being hurt trying to like you know reintegrate myself and I just was maybe 70 80 percent on my hamstring and I, got, I'm, I only retained, what, half of the offense, if that. And so they decided to redshirt me, which was fine. You know, it was, it was just the best possible option. Save me a year, whatever, whatever. So we get through the season. I get a little healthy. I come back out for track. And I end up getting hurt again. Hurt the same hamstring. And at the time, me and the then sprint coach wasn't really, like, getting along. Wasn't seeing out of out a lot of stuff. And it's just, I got to the point where, like, I mean, I won't say exactly what was said, but I just felt kind of play it like you know and just undervalued for like the the athlete that I was I mean it was a little bit of ego yeah but it was a lot of pride and so I got to the point where I was just like you know what man like for me I gotta do what's best for me and right now that's you know taking this deal with Adidas you know putting my family in a better situation and you know what I'm saying just going you know going with what happens yeah what was the I, conversation I, like ahead. uh with the football staff whenever you made that decision so I can remember, I think Jimbo was getting ready to go to the draft. And um, I went in and talked to him and told him just that, man, like, I, I, I can't do this. Like, it's just not it – it, listen, it takes a whole different type of mentality to, to focus on both things, like doing football and track at the same time. It was just it – was, it was hard for somebody who really hadn't had to deal with, like, anything like that. So I just made it – you know, I made it easy on myself. So when I told him, like, he wasn't, he wasn't for it. But I think by the time he got back, I was gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, if I remember around that time, um, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on with the track program where coaches were leaving. Might, might have been a little bit after, mm -hmm. you know, people like Sage Watson transferred. You know, a, a lot of people left that, that track program. Um, but, you know, that year at FSU, you know, you mentioned the injury. I was going to ask you about that injury and if how much you set you back. I remember hearing you you hurt yourself early, but you know, I guess my first question is: Do you ever look back and think maybe I should have hung on a little bit longer and see how how it unfolded? Or um, the, the the day I had that thought was when I came when I left track to decide that I wanted to go play in the NFL. So, mm -hmm. you know, I kept running into like people telling me, "Oh, well, he's good, but he doesn't really have any experience." And I'm like, "I can't really get experience." if nobody gives me the opportunity and so like really sitting back thinking about that i was like well you know what i probably could stay in school and, and saw what happened because i came out here with guys that are playing on sundays and i'm making plays be that it is practice but i feel like you know if i get comfortable in a game maybe with an opportunity something can happen so it did make me feel good going out there against guys like i said that we see on sunday and i'm making plays and learning the system and all the stuff i could have done you know what i'm saying as an 18 year old and so it started making me think, like, what if I would have stayed in college and kind of saw what happened? You know, obviously we would have got a national championship. But, 
I mean, at the end of the day, I don't look back so long and accept what happened. Yep. Should have had the championship in 2012. But, that is true. You know, we, we, yeah. we, 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 we talk about that with almost every guest at that NC State game in that Bro. <laughs> travesty of a, of a game. I could, like, it's crazy because I could tell you exactly what I was doing when that happened. What was going on at the NC State game? Listen, so some mm-hmm. weeks they would travel me and some weeks they wouldn't. So I would mm-hmm. find out, like, that Wednesday or Thursday that I was going to leave with the team on Friday. So it had hit like Thursday and I didn't find out. So if I didn't find out, then I'm not going. It's NC State, like I'm assuming we're gonna win anyway because of how good we're looking. I mean, listen, I made all kind of plans. I was gonna have some fun. <laughs> I'm watching the game, I'm getting my <laughs> stuff ready. I'm, I think I was ironing my clothes and like they score on the last. I'm like, we finna get to the stop. They score on that play. I was like, oh my God. I literally just like threw it out the side of the bed and just went to sleep. Like I can't I, ain't even, uh, <laughs> I, I was sick. <laughs> <laughs> like you would have thought I was at the game. I was so I was sick, man. Yeah, no, that was close. We've had a lot, like Nate said, we've had a lot of guys on here talk about that game and how rough that was. I don't think they it's not really a fun thing that, <laughs> that they it's like us not, bringing was, up. That was so bad, man. That was that was a special, special team. Uh, let's talk, let's talk some racing here. Let's let's go back and talk about a little Ronald Darby. Who who maybe gave you the toughest toughest time at FSU? And you got to be real with us here. Um, because we always hear Dur- uh Darby. I don't know if you ever – you and Whitfield kind of went at it, but it was more on track, right? Right, yeah. To, we was, that was yeah. in high school, yeah. Yeah. Who? Because uh, we'd keep up with those. I remember we'd keep up – I know Nate definitely was, but we'd keep up with those races in high school and see mm-hmm. who's going to who's gonna end up being the fastest because they were pr- – practically everybody was committed to Florida State, so all the fastest guys in the country. Who, who, who at FSU? So at the it? time um, – Dar- so I will say – like step for step, if we did anything, like it probably was Darby. But outside of that, um, believe it or not, on the football field, I think it was LaMarcus Jonah. Like that, mm-hmm. listen, man, that dude, that dude He's practices different. exactly how he plays. Yeah, mm-hmm. listen, man, I've never seen somebody with that intensity every day. Like, I thought it was an act. You know, like, I saw, obviously, I would come to games on recruitment trips and see him play. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, it's game day, it's Saturday, you get hype, you know, whatever, whatever. But he was like that when I came in from, like, day one until, like, the mm-hmm. end of the season. And I was like, bro, there's no way he's just discharged up on a daily basis. Like, it was scary because I know you can see it on other people's faces. Then you might be tired. Mm-hmm. You might be, man, that man came to practice every day, like, this, every day on the field, too. Like, he's... He's chasing a ball a hundred yards. Like I'm like, bro, like you're doing too much. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, nah, I mean, you making us look bad, you know? Because I catch the ball and slow down. You come through and tackle. Like, come on now. He'd come up. He'd come in with some big time hits, but he would stay stride and stride yeah. with you, going deep. Not really going deep, but like he was mm-hmm. so smart, man. Like he just always knew where to be. And like people, like, they they kind of taught me like, like well, college taught me like football really was a game of angles. Because mm-hmm. I mean, they get to a certain spot. Like, man, there's only so much we can do. Because trust me, man, I tried to. I've got. I don't. I got out of a lot of problems with some speed, but it's just some stuff it can't save you from. So now, nah, like, just not not just from a football perspective, it was him. But step by step, the only person that could run with me was Darby. Darby, yeah, no, I can see. Yeah, that's that's, that's, well, that's so, definitely it. What's the difference between football speed and, and, and track speed? There's some guys that get recruited. They have that track speed that doesn't necessarily carry over to the football field i want to i want to bring so, up a play here like carlos williams like how does yeah, that compare with yeah. los like that guy yeah. can run i mean we saw in the 2013 mm. national championship running so, yeah so when you look at when you look at players like like los or even a derby like it almost looks unreal because you can wonder how somebody that's what six three two twenty five moves you know on the balls of his feet that fast and so mm-hmm. when you look at players like Tyreek Hill, like Tyreek Hill has like track speed. Like I've watched him get on a track and, and, and show me that same, you know, caliber of running. But a lot of fo- football guys, you know, you think about it, they train for 40 yards. So mm-hmm. if my calculations are correct, 40 yards is like 36 meters. Like we're driving, like track athletes are driving for 36 meters. Like that's the beginning of our race. We still mm-hmm. got a whole you know, another 70, 60 to 70 meters 
that we gotta like so track speed is more so just it just looks stronger like it doesn't look as mm. like fast paced because it's it's effortless like carlos really ran effortless and he was a big dude so it was even more mm-hmm. impressive whereas like you see some of these football you see some of these track dudes like they'll break open a 60 yard run and get caught mm-hmm. oh why does that happen oh football, sorry, football dudes they'll break open a 60 yard run and get caught you're like well he's fast yeah but he's he's used that from zero to ten whereas we've stretched that from zero to 30 so mm-hmm. it's just it's mm-hmm. just it's, it's, it's really different man because like dk running 10 37 like it had everybody impressed we was like okay like that's that's pretty good yeah. for somebody his size mm-hmm. and not really training for track and field like that is that's like that we can respect that mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah, think it, about like nine nine seven nine eight wins races yeah I, I, I think you made a good point though too you know people make a lot of big deal about the 40 but it, it's a trained exercise more than anything i, I think it's all about exactly. You train you train your start your first 10 yards makes you 40. yeah you know, maybe i'm wrong but you know the long speed i think is what makes a difference why tyree yeah, exactly. is so ridiculous in the nfl you know it's crazy man it's like wild. tyree Hill he, can get away from people and stay away from people like that's mm-hmm. that's what i'm saying like he doesn't mm-hmm. when he gets around you he doesn't come back like there's no maybe <laughs> i might keep hustling like it's, it's gone bro <laughs> like, yeah if you it's bye-bye blow the angle just stop running yeah Yep. you're screwed what puts what, what's like a training day like for you diet wise and also workout wise definitely as you're preparing for this world championship what does that look like for you um well at this at this part of the season i mean the foundation like the foundation has been late you know what i'm saying like we done we've done we've been training since october so we mm-hmm. the done the base work is done the sprint work is done everything is done like we are just is at this point it's just like fine tuning like it's every day feels like a walkthrough if that makes sense if i can put that for uh for my you know my football people it's like it's not gonna be like nothing is really strenuous like you're only t- touching the gas a couple of times just making sure you know what i'm saying the tires are inflated the i don't know just everything yeah. is just everything is yeah everything like, it's just like it's not it's just prep for a big track I mean, there's no more like actual working out mm-hmm. do you ever get nerves going into some of these i know you've competed in the olympics you've been competed in some big time races the premier type kind of races in track and field do you ever get any kind of nerves in any way shape or form um yeah they got like, race day i usually wake up with like i wake up with some nerves um but i think it's like the good kind of nerves though you know like um because i still you know i still care when i go out there so just for me it's still fun i'm still fresh you know being able to walk away and come back um I've already saw big races early in my career. So like, I'm not really, I'm never scared out there. Like, I, it's just, it's just like practice to me, you know, and um, just with people. So uh, once you go ahead, go ahead. I know once, once you, once you just got into like that mentality in the sport, like it makes like running in bigger races a lot easier. Uh, I want to ask about a little bit about, um, you know, coming off the world championship and, I, you know, I kind of ask long questions. Dustin kind of okay. teases me a little bit about it, but um, you know, the Jamaicans have dominated the last decade. More than that, I think. More. You know, but it seems like you know American track is kind of making a comeback. You know, you have you, you have Curly, you have um, Bromel, and then you have you know Noah Lyles in the two hundred and Area Knight, and you know it seems like there's a lot of um really young kids young guys that are primed to kind of take it back so you know what are your thoughts of, of how that world championship went you know it's really competitive in that final and, and how you feeling going into that that world championship sorry the u.s championship was what was competitive not the world championship but yeah how, um how you so feeling for about, me so um, for me um i i love to see it man like i love to see that you know everything is so wide open like think mm-hmm. about it. when you when you're when as a fan of a sport when you watch a race like do you really want to know who's gonna win all the time like yes yeah, it's nice for people to you know be dominating their sport like we only get so many of those of those athletes but you gotta think about the majority are a lot of people working hard to achieve the same thing so i mean both mm-hmm. was just a special talent man like that 
it was nothing yeah. we can do about that one. Like he's just, <laughs> he was like Jordan. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. he was like LeBron. Like it's nothing we. It's, you just gotta wear it. Yeah, you yeah. just. You know yeah, what I'm saying? You get in where you. Yeah, like it was just nothing yeah. we can do about it. And so with him out of the way, you know, with him retired, and a lot of the you know the older guys retiring as well around his era, it's just nice to see a bunch of young guys fighting for the same things and making it more competitive. Mm-hmm. Like that's what sports really is about, competition. So. Mm-hmm. You know, as a as a track fan, as as one of the athletes that's competing, like it's nice to know that you know I got a legit shot to go in there and get a world title. So to see to see you know everything, you know, go how it does, um, I'm 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 really looking forward to it. Yeah, no, I was a big I'm a big time got the shirt here. I'm a big time Usain Bolt fan, and I agree with you though in that oh, regard yeah. of you know you just always know hey, and I, I got I got a question too to ask about <laughs> Bolt too. I don't know if you've ever been around him or anything, but. Have you have you ever had any kind of uh, situations with him and talk with him? Any? I mean, I don't know what he comes off as behind the scenes. No, nah, he's a re- he's actually a really man, he's a really down to earth, really cool guy, man. Uh, you can actually walk up and have a conversation with him. And um, <clears throat> not right now, not right now. Please stop, please stop. Not right now. Uh, you can have a conversation with him. He's a really nice dude. We actually um, in 2016, uh, accidentally, like for his birthday, we all ended up in like the same club, and he was uh, he was really cool about it. Um, yeah, no, nah, I mean, but I don't have really, like, I'm not, you know, I'm not really in their camp like that. So I don't really know too much about them. Yeah, no, I mean, with those races too, I mean, I think the thrill of him going to break world records, I think is what everybody in the Olympics wanted to watch. That, that's the reason why they were in the stands. But now the reason why there's, there's people in the stands, there's so many guys that can go here now and take away the hundred meter world championship. Who do you think, who do you think is going to give you either in the U S or across the sea is going to give you the biggest kind of competition here. Um, I mean, I mean, respectfully, you know, I think that there's a lot of guys that can come and, you know, I guess make a, make a shot at the belt. But um, I mean, obviously right now, right here in America, I just experienced somebody running nine seven. So right now he's mm-hmm. the guy that he's the fastest time. He's really consistent. So right now, I mean, that's who, that's who we, you know, that's 976 is, you know, he laid the mark. So if that's what he's capable of going, then we got to be able to go that or faster to go and beat him. Do you think that's around that time that's going to take to win world championship? Yeah, honestly, to be, yeah. If I'm being honest in that stadium, the way it's set up, like it produces fast times. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's going to, it's going to take something incredibly fast to win that race. I want to go back, and I believe, and I might be completely wrong on this because it's been a little while now, but the last Olympics and you trying to qualify for that, you went through, I believe, an injury. Was it the same hamstring when you were going to qualify for the last Olympic, the last Olympics? Because I remember, I believe I was watching that too, and I was extremely pissed off. I'm pretty sure I was tweeting about <laughs> it, but I was, pretty, I was pretty ticked off about it because I felt bad for you, and I thought that you were having a really strong season. Was that how? How was that going through that? Because I'm sure that was pretty hard mentally on you. Um, yeah, no, nah, man, it was it was definitely tough. Um, I think at about thirty meters in the semis semifinals, I kind of feel like tightened up a little bit, and um, I just pulled out, man, because I thought you know I didn't want to make it worse. So um, I think I, I ended up getting you know getting the proper treatment that I needed, and then I came back out like my first race out. And ran no, not my first race. A couple of races later, I ran my personal best again. So I ran. I ended up running like nine eighty five in like Memphis. So to come back and and run like that, you know, off of an injury, um, it 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 just let me know more about myself than you know anything else. Like that type of to fight through that type of adversity. So at this point, there's nothing I can't really go through. Dustin, we're gonna ask something. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, what's the difference between preparing mentally and physically for a football game versus one of these um, events, you know, because a football game, it, it feels like you kind of have a chance to settle in throughout four quarters. Whereas one of these races, it's over in, in just a couple of seconds. It's start, go, stop. Man, it's so, it's so, it's so different. Um, football is really more, it's really more, like mental, like it really is. A, it's, well, no, I guess track is more mental, but football is like physically you're going to be what you're going to be. If you're tired, like your body only going to let you do so much, but you have like, you have 10 other people on the field with you at a time and a coach to kind of help you like through it. Like they can mask that and stuff. They can 
scheme for certain stuff. So it's like you you kind of have more of a cushion. You know what I'm saying? Like you even if you ain't having a, even if you don't have a good game, y'all can still win. Mm-hmm. So like mm-hmm. track, it's it's like it's like ten percent like it's like ten percent physical and like ninety percent mental because it's like if you've gotten yourself there physically like training wise, then like if you truly believe in what you're gonna do, then you're gonna go out there and execute, and it makes running so much easier. But everybody doesn't get to that mode, which is why on any given day, everybody doesn't run the absolute fastest. There's a reason why somebody is gonna get eighth, you know, because we all go out there and execute to our potential, like it'll be a better race. But you got some people that can just that are just a little sharper. So you just try to get there like mentally and know that like everything is gonna click. And if you put it all together, then fast times will come. And that's where your confidence comes from. What that's your, a question. I was going to ask something like that, Logan. Logan. Yeah, I was going to say one of your strongest talents is indoor too, and this is from a question on YouTube from Coach Ortiz asking you, what do you enjoy more, indoor, outdoor, and why also? How can you break down your phases in the 100 meters? Um, so for me, I used to love – I used to like – in the beginning of my beginning of my career, I loved indoor more. Like obviously it was shorter, less running, and training was easier. But as I've, as I, you know, my resurgence in track and field has made me, has gave me a great appreciation for like, like outdoor and master in the 100 because that's the event that everybody, you know, loves and adores and cares about. Like it'll always be uh, a high class event, like no matter how fast or how slow the times are. And as far as um, breaking down my phases for the 100, so now that I'm a lot stronger than I used to be, now that I trust in my abilities a little bit more. We've kind of stretched the race out. So like we we naturally have a, I've naturally always had a good start. So from about zero to maybe 30, 35 meters, um, it's just my drive phase. Like I'm pushing as hard as humanly possible while like slightly picking up the pace. Like it's, it's very hard to explain, but mm-hmm. like with each step, you're trying to get a little bit more violent, but not as violent as you can be. And then at about, 35 meters is when like I'm hitting it. Like I'm giving it everything I got until I can feel myself no longer accelerate. So you're only accelerating for like four, four and a half seconds if you really like that. So that's gonna give me about 50 meters if that. So I'm at about 80 meters. So the last 20 meters, I'm just hanging on and trying to make sure I execute certain positions because if I can get my body in certain positions, once I strike the ground, it's still going to feel like I'm propelling myself forward, even though I'm getting no faster. So at about 80 meters, everybody's just trying to hang on. So mm-hmm. nobody's getting faster. Everybody is, somebody's just getting slower, a lot slower than everybody else, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it definitely does. You've been able to travel to a lot of these races too. What's your favorite venue to play at? Um, I think so far, Monaco was probably my favorite place to race. Oh damn! Like it was probably yeah, it was probably one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, man. Like you could see the money. It's just how beautiful it was. <laughs> you could see the yeah, yachts. <laughs> like you can see it's nothing but yacht. Yeah, man. Like it was, it was, it was different. It was different than anything I've ever seen. So I think Monaco just for like the atmosphere, like the track is great, and they, like the, the the meat promoters put on a really good. They put on a really good race. I was gonna when, say yeah. When, when did you know, like you had this ability, you know, world. Well, like one one in a few. When did you know you had this? Um I figured that out in my sophomore year of high school. Um, so I had I did not run track as a freshman. Like I didn't do I didn't play football as a freshman, I didn't run track as a freshman. Um I played football as a sophomore, but I was on like J V and I didn't even get moved up. Uh, <laughs> but that's another story. Um <laughs> So I joined the track team. Like I had some friends that was like, hey man, like join the track team with us. Like, you know, you kind of fast, but you know, it's like, all right, cool. Like I ain't had nothing better to do. I joined the track team. So he would not let me run a hundred like all year. And I kept like begging the man, like, dude, like I don't want to run a 200, 200. I don't like the 200. It's not my race. Um, but I, w- I would like win the 200. So he was like, all right, I'll let you run a hundred next week. And I think I ran like 10, eight and everybody was making like a big deal about it. So then the very next race was the very next week. I ran 1076. And again, people start making a bigger deal about it. So then I went to the I went to the district championships and I ran ten fifty eight. And now I'm getting the questions of like, you know, where have you came from? Because <laughs> I mean, also I was at a, you know I was at a predominantly white high school, so you mm. know what I'm saying. Like everybody's like, hold on, how did you just get dropped in? Like what? No, like you don't just run that fast out of nowhere. 
So the next week at the regional championships, I won. I think I ran ten forty one, or ten forty two. Damn. And um, then obviously now I'm being called the favorite or whatever for the state championship, and I go and I ran like ten nineteen, but I had like a two point eight win. So then when that happened, everybody was like, "All right, like, come on now." And so mm-hmm. I think like three or four days later, three or four days later, I played in our spring football game and I scored like three times. And then that's when everybody was like, "Oh, he plays football too." <laughs> and that's kind of how like everything got started. Were you were you getting offers pretty quickly or getting calls and emails after that state championship? Let's little like the next morning, my coach called me and he was like, "Hey, man, um, you know LSU and Florida." And Miami, I'll talk to you and talk to me about you last night. And I'm like, what do you mean talk? You know, like, <laughs> what do you mean talk to you about me? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. And um, he just kind of explained to me the process and, you know, just kind of how it works. And like what people officially offering me and stuff. But Florida State actually was my very first official offer. Damn. Wow. That's awesome. I didn't even know that. Like soon as as soon as like the debt, like the thing uh, window hit, like they they faxed it over Made to the school. Move. And that's how long ago it was because they faxed it. Damn. Yeah, I was about to say, hey, they're not they're not that old. They're not that old. I was gonna ask, how long do you think you're gonna be uh running track? Do you think this is uh gonna go for you you think that at least the next uh Olympics, which would be twenty four, if I'm correct, for the summer Olympics? Yeah, so so there's actually so actually there's a world championship in twenty twenty five. Um, and I think that, you know, I would consider then, you know, kind of how my career is gone, but I kinda wanna make it to uh 2025 like i feel like i've robbed myself you know of a couple years you know trying to play football and and everything not going my way and not even really giving track my all when i was here the first time so you know i've dedicated my career to doing that and um i'm really just gonna be here until i'm not here to be honest with you but if i've won you know some medals from here to 2025 i can rest my head knowing i did everything i could and it's just time to sell off I love, I absolutely love the four by one. And what it was, I mean, I know obviously 100 meters your your favorite, but what do you think about the four by one? Because that is one of the most exciting things to watch on television as being a fan of track and field and running in the past. Four by it one, is. there's something different. That and four by four, I think, are mm. some exciting stuff, man, when it's on TV and televised like that. Do you, do you enjoy the four by one? And do you like to, I don't know, do you like anchoring? Yeah, the, so the four by one actually was my, um, it was probably my favorite event. Uh, um, because like it's just like I mean the hundred is you know the hundred was fun, but it was just nice to be a part of the team aspect of track and field. You know, I mean our team wasn't that good in high school, so I would get a baton and like six <laughs> and I had to go run people down. So like that just became like a normal thing. Like it became a game. Like how many people can I catch today? Mm-hmm. So um, <laughs> no, I definitely love the four by one. I wouldn't mind anchoring. Um, we're actually in talks of like how everything's gonna go now. We have a relay camp coming up soon. Um, that we'll get some work in or whatever. Um, so I'm excited about that, man. It's nice to, you know, uh, hopefully we can, you know, be one of the USA teams that get it right. How, how, how do you think that team looks if you had to, you know, like see it right now? How, how's that four that four by one team look? Oh, I think it might be getting a phone call. Um, but yeah, no, I'm also wondering what uh, country might be the biggest competition there for them because I haven't really caught up with the Jamaican side. I want to say. Ah, I forget who in the Olympics did really well this past um, that French Olympic guy. summer. Was it the Fr- Was it the French that did really well? France. Yeah. Chi- uh, Chi- France. There, there, I go. there I go. Sorry. There you go. Now you're Sorry. back. Yep, you got me? you. Go ahead. Yep. No, you're good. Sorry. Yeah, who was who is going to be your biggest comp? Well, how does y'all's four by one team look now? Who do you think? Oh, you know, with the guys that you have, and then also, who do you think is going to be your biggest competition um, outside of the U.S.? So, um. So Christian Coleman has the buy, so he's automatically on the team for World Championships um, because mm-hmm. he was the previous World Champion. You got me, Fred, uh, and Trey will all be in the hundred as well. So we have four Americans in the hundred. Um, wow. And as far as the four by one goes, we don't really know the order. Like I mean, I can kind of guess maybe um, you got Christian on the first, like he has a really good start. Um, you got myself and Fred who will probably take uh, going in straightaways. Um, I don't know if it'll be two or two for me or four for me, and then Trayvon. But I mean, you can really play with it because all of us can do pretty much anything, mm-hmm. as far as uh as far as running. So, however they want to, you know, tweak it. Like I think Christian Coleman will probably be the start of the. Who who runs the better turns? Um, I want to say Fred. Like Fred has a lot of experience in the two hundreds. 
Mm-hmm. So he does run a lot of turns, but I mean, the guy's like six three. You don't really want to like waste that on a turn. Like no, you, you want to keep nah. him on yeah. a straightaway, you know, opening up his stride. So mm-hmm. it'll come down to, you know, me or Trey doing a turn. Um, I mean, we both kind of got the same experience as far as running two hundreds. I mean, he's ran faster than me, but I mean, it's only a hundred meters, so that really doesn't matter how fast he ran in the two hundred as far right. as the turn goes. Um, but he, I mean, I train with him. And he's a really good turn runner, and I think he wants to run third, so it'll just make it. It ain't easier mm-hmm. for everybody. You've you've obviously been around some absolute legends. We're talking in track and field. I think you came in at a perfect spot to see a lot of these veterans. You had Jamaica Johan Blake, obviously, bold in what he did. Then you had Walter Dix at home here at FSU. I mean, um, I mean, you had a whole ton of great, great, uh, <laughs> great veterans that you could work your mind off. Is there anybody that kind of you idled that you used to kind of um, you know get you in the game a little bit? mentally so um i trained with tyson actually i trained with tyson gay like from at like 19 years old so for about two years there two three years there um i got to work with him and just kind of see him work and see him operate man and see you know how professional he was and how he like treated you know track and field and you know some of it rubbed off on me but at the time and i was so young that like i was still caught up in being just myself so much that like i didn't really like adjust my lifestyle to be like that, to get to attain those things. I thought like, you know, it's like, you know, any young person, we think we can do anything our way. You know, I can take Mm -hmm. some Mm -hmm. of your parts and still do my thing and it'll mesh because we think we have the perfect way. But that just wasn't, it just wasn't the case. Um, I did have success. Like I did, you know, I did do some things, but um, learning from that guy, man, was everything because, I mean, he's an American record holder. Like right now we're chasing his American record. Mm-hmm. So to see him operate and to see somebody run that fast and just kind of what they do, like it's not surprising to me that, you know, I am capable of those things and now I see what it takes to get there. Mm-hmm. Like, it's uh, it, it, it's race day, you know, it's the finals. What, what are you listening to in the earphones? What what, what, what gets you hyped up? Uh, I think it dropped. I think someone, hey, popular man, man. <laughs> and I forgot yeah. too that the world champions are going to be in Oregon this mm-hmm. year too so i wonder if that plays any part he likes traveling or not traveling into some of these world championships because being able to bring in four u.s guys on the 100 meter mm-hmm. that's that's impressive that is definitely impressive i'm interested to see how yeah this, uh, it, it, it's a reemergence of u.s track and field man mm-hmm. like, and i'm here for it i'm back i'm, I'm yep. here go. Yeah, sorry man I, I had to put it on airplane mode no you're good you can ask <laughs> it again nate no, you put on airplane mode. <laughs> yeah. Just, oh, it, well, it, it's uh, it's race day. You know, what are you listening to in the in the earphones that gets you, you know, in that mindset, gets you pumped up? Um, so I I've struggled with being like too pumped up on race day. Man, I mean, one race, I woke up like listening to Tupac, and I think that Man, like I, like I just kind of fried myself. <laughs> I, just, I kind of listen, I'm talking about 8 a.m. going to breakfast, listening to Tupac, and I think I just kind of like fried my circuit, man. And uh, by the time I got there, like I was just way too pumped up. Um, but sometimes I listen to, you know, I listen to a bit of um, like R&B in the morning to just kind of keep me relaxed. Like mm-hmm. I can save all my energy for, you know, the warm-up area slash, you know, the race. So once I get, you know, but once it's time to kind of like start getting ready to head to the track, like the music gets a little bit more upbeat. Mm-hmm. And by the time it's time to warm up, like I'm listening to probably like some NBA young boy or little baby or something that's just going to get me going. You know, like it's, it's all gas from here. Yeah, honestly, that was one of the hardest things is like when you when it's race day, like you want to race and you already have your times posted and everything. So, you know, when you are going to race, but sometimes waiting out there, at least in high school, just waiting there in the locker room or just chilling outside and just sitting there and watching everybody else race. That was one of the hardest things just to conserve that energy because you kind of just want to, I would way rather just race right off the bat, you know, first, first posting times. It, it sucks you know, waiting. You know, same, same for us, but no, actually fun fact, I ran a race in China at 10 5 PM. Damn. So like I only had one race that day, just one race. And it was at 10 5 PM their time. So that was like 10 5 AM for you. Listen, man, like for us, it's even worse because like in high school, at least you're at the track. Like you get to see the stuff going on. You get to watch races and stuff. Yeah. As a professional, if I race at, if I race at 5.15, I'm leaving the hotel. I got to get to the track two hours before. 
you get there two hours before they have a call it will have what's called a call room so the call room literally they can call you 30 minutes before the race you all runners have to report to a certain place and they can like check you in make sure they walk you to the lanes like stuff like that so let's say if i were set, like i said if i were set 5 30 or 5 30 uh the call room is at five o'clock i've gotten to the track at 4 30 so or 3 30 i'm sorry and so like i have to sit for about 30 minutes to start warming up and like everything is like on a schedule because you want to make sure like you're at a certain part of your warm up at a certain time so that you don't have to kind of like rush because that's how people get hurt so if i start warming up at 2 30 like at 3 30 I'll, I'll be done you know and getting ready to prep for the race and stuff so it's a lot that goes into it man it's very detail oriented so what's it like running that fast i don't know if anyone's <laughs> ever asked you like you know it, it's got to feel different you know like you probably um, don't even feel your feet hit the ground see okay so so i mean you know how they say like the calmest part of like a tornado is like in the eye like in the center that mm -hmm. So what it's like for us so it's like to me it really doesn't feel that fast like i didn't feel like i was moving that fast like you don't really don't feel that until like you're really racing people but even then like you gotta think about it you can't count to 9.85 so that's how fast like it comes and goes so the gun goes off and then nine seconds later i'm somewhere else like you really just you don't feel it you just you just run man and whatever happens happens like you'll know if you're uncomfortable and if it's not a fast run but like when you're comfortable and like you hitting and clicking on all cylinders, you don't really feel yourself moving that fast. Like it feels like it's going in slow motion. And that's when we run the fastest. Do you like count steps in your mind? No, of, you, of no, how many steps you need to, no. You I mean, some it? people can. No, you just because yeah. I think, I mean, I think when Boat broke the world record, he took like 43 or 44 steps, something like that. Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. less. But like you don't have time in nine seconds to count one, two, three, four, five, right. six, seven. You know, you just, no, you just go, man. And yeah. you execute phases like, you know, like we practice, we practice what a certain run should look like. So if you can get in a race and you do that exact run from practice, then you're going to be good every time. But you got to think about like most people in the heat of battle, like when you got somebody next to you to do that, like you're not as comfortable because you know it's a race. So like you have to like hone in and still kind of execute that same race without with people next to you, not even worried about it. Like, you know how they have like horses put on blinders, like something like that. Like you have to put on your blinders. Yeah, I'm watching. I'm watching this. What which race? I don't know if you can see it on your screen, Marvin. I can see it now. Yeah, it's kind of choppy. Here we go. I'll bring it back. I'm trying to see because your your one of your strengths is your get off and your start, correct? Right. Yeah, and this one, I feel like if I if this will ever load for me, I don't know. Whenever we go streaming, everything just decides to just stop working. But this one right here, I think this was a nine eight six. I don't know six, where yeah. this is at. I don't know where it was where is in, this uh, at? It was in Zagreb, Croatia. Croatia. Okay. Yeah. See, now that seems like a pretty decent start. Was that a good start for you in this race? Yeah, that was, a, that was actually a really good start. A really good one. Yeah. Do you think? Yeah. I mean, going into this championship, I was. We. I just looked. You know, y'all are going to be competing in the U.S. Do you think you have an edge there because it's in the U.S. or does that really even matter? You think that's just all bogus BS? No. Um. I mean, in a lot of cases uh that hometown you know home field advantage it, it matters like it helps a lot um it really also be about the travel man like you gotta realize like when we go to these places so for world indoor championships it was in Ser it was in uh serbia uh uh what city i forgot what city it was but belgrade it was in belgrade serbia so the championship started on the 18th I think I had to go over there. Like I had to leave my house and fly to Croatia, uh, fly to Serbia on the 13th. Actually, yeah, on the 12th, and I got in on the 13th. So then I had to like kind of let my body come back down, and then kind of like you know acclimate myself to like their time zone and everything. So I got to fall asleep on their time zone and everything, and um, prep myself for three rounds of the 60 in the same day to run as fast as I can. So it's just nice to kind of have the advantage of like travel, where like I'm in the U.S. Like I ain't got to go that far. We don't have to travel mm -hmm. for. 15 16 hours like we just we going up the road so that you know having you know the crowd on our side like i think that'll that'll be big because you gotta think about like all these races are in europe somewhere and we're not from yep. you know we're not from there so they love certain athletes but you know here every athlete is gonna get some love like i think that'll i think that'll matter and just hometown pride man like we we get it on our soil like it's very competitive you know it's gonna feel us to do the best we can mm -hmm. how, how much weight you carrying uh, right now, maybe 175 pounds. 
the, I think maybe race day 172. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, that's where you want to be? Yeah, uh, that's yeah. I mean, I've gotten a lot stronger. So I used to race mm-hmm. at about 168, 169. And um, I mean, I'm up from there. Obviously, actually, when I went to play football, like I never just got all the way back down there, but I prog- I, know I continuously got stronger. And so mm-hmm. the strength to weight ratio is working right now. So I think about 175 is like, you know, where I need to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's 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 moving still at that weight. That's uh, that's just wild how fast these guys these guys can move. Um, I just one last thing for me, you know, thoughts going into the championship. I know we've talked about it a ton, but what are you expecting from yourself with this? Because you know that was a pretty interesting qualifier there that you just went through, and the guy ran really well. But what do you think you're you're gonna going to stand with that i know you see a guy moving that fast do you feel like you got to move that fast you know it, it all depends on the day yeah. and the race and everything but what's your yeah no man um one thing about one thing about this sport is like you know i, I relate to football with football you know if a, a team has a strength all you do is just you know you do everything you're proud to take away the strength um fortunately unfortunately in track and field we can't do that so when a guy's running really good all you can do is up your game and run a better race. Like I didn't run the best race I could run, which, you know, gets me excited because I know that I have more in store and I can, you know, I can be up there. Um, if I would have ran the best race I ever ran and that's what happened, like it'd be a different story. You know, I'd be like, well, what do I improve? Because I gave it everything I had. So no, you just, you know, I've watched the race probably a thousand times by now. I've broken it down a thousand different ways and I see what I need to do better. And it's just about, you know, challenging myself to, to be able to go in there, you know, under those lights, you know, with, you know, the whole world watching to just execute you know, the race that I know I can execute. Because right now I know that, you know, with a uh, with a good race, I'm 985. So what can I be with a great race? Mm-hmm. And do we have an exact day on when we should keep an eye out for the 100 meter qualifiers? I know. I don't yeah. Know so the, the any- qualifiers or well, the first round will be on July 15th and then we'll come back the next day on the 16th and run the semifinals and the finals. Okay. Okay. So I have two, three, hopefully, you know, we'll have three. I'm, I'm just praying. I think if you, you're a threat, if you just stay healthy, I mean, I feel like that's how it's kind of been throughout your career. If you can just, if things stay healthy and things are kicking there, then that's, I think we're putting a pretty good spot. That would be, that'd be incredible, man, to get on that podium there. Um, Definitely up there in Eugene. That would be, (laughs) that would be some badass stuff, man. No, listen, Go ahead. You know, I was, I was, gonna, I was gonna say, man, I, like, we, we on the same, we on the same side there, man. It's just, it's, it's, it always sucks when like stuff like that happens because you know if you don't have an indicator, like you just can't stay mm-hmm. in front of it, like you just, and that's, that's, the, that's, that's, that's the nature of this game, you know. Um, it's all health, you know, because like I, they always say, your best ability is your availability. So you know, some people just have better luck with stuff like that. Some people are just better prepared. So you know, we're taking all the necessary steps to make sure little nicks and nicks like this don't happen when we need them to not happen the most. So I can attest to you that everything has been done and, you know, we'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Sounds good to me. I like that. I like hearing that. So everybody, if you're listening right now, I'm sure we'll be covering and watching it too. But uh, Marvin Bracey will be competing starting on July 15th in the 100-meter uh, race and you know, we'll see. We'll see. I, I think, I think we're going to do pretty good though. Uh, everybody's pulling for you. I know here, at least in Tallahassee and definitely the U.S. will. Yeah, I'm glad that y'all got a home crowd too you. for once. For once, man, you get a home crowd. It's going to be, it's going to be lit. It's going to be lit. once, man. Like that's, <laughs> yeah, that's going to be fun, man. I'm it's going to be lit. It. Well, Marvin, I appreciate you hopping on here for practically an hour and everything, and we'll keep we'll keep in okay. touch. And man, if if you hit that podium, we're getting your ass back on here. Just letting you know, yes, sir. No, we can do that, man. We will definitely do that, man. I definitely appreciate y'all having me, man. It's nice to meet all y'all, and uh, I look forward to speaking with y'all soon. Absolutely, man. Have a good one, yeah. and best right, good luck, luck, right, Have a good day. Thank yep. you, Marvin. Good luck. Yep. Awesome, awesome stuff there. And then we bring in definitely not a hundred meter qualifier in the world championships austin <laughs> vz here is now with us yeah no shot <laughs> that hip ain't gonna do it hip knees ankle anything this man's got an 80 year old body what do you, you think know, logan you're, you're pretty confident you know. against lows but could you beat marvin bracy no shot no <laughs> shot i'm lucky that carlos has like an extra 40 or so maybe you know no you know i'm not knocking on lows here but maybe another 50 pounds on me right now but on Bracy, I'm not. I'm not having a chance. I'm not having a chance whatsoever. Um, I didn't bring it up. There's. I thought y'all would, but um, luckily didn't have to be brought up in front of Marvin. 
I think. I thought but, about it, but he seemed he seemed too respectful to go in on you. So I was like, <laughs> he, he's a he's family, so he's he's he'd probably be nice and say that I'd have a chance if I had a <laughs> forty meter start, maybe. But yeah, no. Best of luck representing the U.S. Man, a hundred meters, and you know, looking at some of those times internationally, there's a shot. There's a shot. Yeah, definitely you can get on that podium. If not, so that nine seven is is the time. Yeah, and he said that he didn't run his best. He felt like mm -hmm. he didn't run his best, and that was one of his best. Um, he said that he can potentially go up there. I've, you know, you run a better time than that, you can get gold. So we'll be keeping an eye on that next month, July 15th. Up there in Eugene, Oregon, let's get over to the football side and get started here. A pretty busy week overall. We'll start off with the ACC making some changes there. Going under the 355 scheduling model which will eventually be eliminating division starting in 2023, making sure everybody knows that this is not going to affect this upcoming season. It will go into effect next year. Uh, there are three Florida States, three permanent opponents will be Clemson, Miami and Syracuse. Those will face each other annually. Um, now uh, the new model means that the Florida state Seminoles will play every ACC school every other year. Any initial thoughts from this? I don't really find much of a problem with it. I personally, just going over to one of the sides of it, I personally like the best two teams out of the conference get to play in the ACC championship just for it makes sense, makes more sense for views and ratings and watching it and interests me more than watching maybe a 2013 Florida State team facing a Duke in an ACC championship. That I just know is going to be over in the first or second quarter. And I don't mind Syracuse. I would maybe like Boston just to go visit, but I'm don't ever. I'm never going to go to Syracuse <laughs> anyway. Should have been no, Georgia it doesn't Tech. Doesn't bother me. Should have been Georgia Tech. That's the natural, you know, regional rival. Syracuse doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think the only reason they did is to spread the national brand. You know, if yep. you stay southeast, you can only spread southeast. But if you, you know, try and spread the northeast brand a little bit. Yeah, it seemed pretty pretty standard overall i do like that florida state's going to be able to actually play every team in the conference every other year from here on out it feels like forever since i mean i, I don't when's the last time that they played virginia you know i think it's been three or four years at this point and maybe even longer for some other 2021 opponents. or 2020 I don't, I don't think it was yeah. 21 but yeah 2020. There, there's teams that they haven't played in in a couple years and you know matchups you don't get to see that often anymore and i think this will that'll only help the the conference yeah I, I think the athletic posted in the article before last season the last time florida state had played in chapel hill at north carolina it was like 2009 and now it's going to be every what every four years and for, for mm -hmm. me that's great you know i'm live up here in north carolina and there's going to be very few years where i don't get at least two games up here i think that's great for for people that don't live in Tallahassee. i think it's great i think it doesn't matter because fsu needs to get out of the conference also that We'll see yeah. what happens with that. <laughs> you know, but th that's another discussion for another day. But, you know, USC and UCLA be opening up the uh, Pandora's box, you know, create chaos and let's see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, should, uh, they? should they leave? Should they leave, Nate? I saw yes, the tweet. I saw the tweet. What would, uh, yes. what would be the pros? The pros for Florida State leaving the Atlantic Coast the, Conference. The conference, conference. the conference sucks for one. Um, monetarily, you know, to compete with everyone. Right now you need money. And in three, the ACC sucks. Um, four, the <laughs> ACC sucks. But no, I mean, you know, I, 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 I think that in five to six years, it's going to be a completely different, you know, spectrum of college football. It's going to be, I think, four conferences, tops, and, and we'll see how that looks, you know. And FSU, they got to get into the SEC or the, the Big Ten to, uh, to stay competitive. You know, the, just, big, the Big Ten, they had more financially on the TV packages in the SEC, I believe, last year. It, it's one, just I, tough with these TV deals right now because I think yep. the ACC it, one signed to like 2036, mm -hmm. I think is what the year is. That, and that's, that's really tough to renegotiate and try and get the money figured out. I've seen a lot of money. They try to back out, you know, anytime in the near future. I I, I think at this rate, you know, I, I I think that you know I think there would be chaos where you you have these conferences trying to you know they'll pay the buyout or something. You know, there's going to be something that ha happens because you're going to have a 
I would say two handfuls of teams that are going to be looking to move around to to stay relevant. You know, not just FSU, Clemson, Miami. You know, UCF. You know, they're joining the big the Big Twelve, right? In twenty twenty five. No, next year. Uh, was it next year? Yep. So I mean, it's an arms race, and you know, Florida State. You know, if they got to pay a five hundred. Not five hundred million. That's a lot of money, but a fifty million dollar fine. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. We need the Spanx lady now. Yeah, now, where's you know, the Spanx yeah. lady at? You know, we need it, the five hundred milli now. It, 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 it was fifty million. It's fifty million. Figure it out. You know. I mean, I mean, this is gonna get. It's gonna get crazy, and I think the ACC is gonna get left behind. Yeah. Well, you see what happened obviously today with the USC UCLA news mm-hmm. and what they're planning on doing, and seems to be an effective kind of immediately thing after what this upcoming season and they're it's I mean yeah they're they're like I'm I have a feeling now it's not gonna no one's gonna care about what region you're in and all this kind of stuff that's how all these conferences practically started now they're just gonna be three mega ones and you're just gonna try to combine these different scheduling systems correct I mean and it it, it kind of sucks for the the non-revenue sports you know they're they're having to pay a lot more to travel but at this rate it doesn't really matter because you know Football is a big brand pretty much everywhere now. Mm-hmm. Make it happen. I'd rather go to the Big Ten than the SEC. Same. Mm. Why is that? Um, you know, Austin made a good point. The national, national, you know, the national exposure. Um, you know, th- there's a lot of old money up there. There's a lot of, you know, th- their, their Big Ten network makes a lot of money. Um, different. Mm-hmm. Different games, man. You know, different teams to play. Um, yeah, man. I mean, I don't know. This yeah. is what I feel. Well, anything would <laughs> I just, practically I just, be I better think than the, the I think the history of the Big Ten, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, you think about Michigan. You think about Ohio State. You think about even Penn State a little bit. I mean, those are some of the premier programs in college football for Wisconsin a century. Yeah, Wisconsin. But then it would it also be fun to play Georgia, Bama, LSU. You know, it it, it would be really cool to play at LSU with mm-hmm. a good Night team, game. with a with a with a with a team that can make it to a bowl. You know, and I'm just putting into like what we're dealing with here currently. In yeah. We're hoping we're hoping optimistic. This is an optimistic podcast. We hope that yeah. things are changing. It seems like you know things are might we, be You look at that 2026 20, schedule. So yeah, you're, you're practically facing a mix of everything yeah, Bama, in that. Yeah. Bama, Notre Dame, Clemson. That's, that's a tough schedule for 2026. Yeah, hopefully. You think we'll all still be friends on here by then? Uh, Dustin, no. But <laughs> the others, yeah, we'll still. I could see myself getting in like a car accident or something by then. Jesus. Christ. Okay. What the hell? I was just about to bring up that we're going to be uh, driving over to New Orleans. Hell, we just oh, the well, there you go. Perfect opportunity. Uh, uh, not with uh, me involved. You do that on yeah. your own. I, 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 I'm about to in the hotels by myself. <laughs> he'll he'll burn his eyelashes with a vape and have to, you know. No, uh, they, they got, go they, they, Jewel got banned by the FDA. So I no longer mm-hmm. own a vape. So well, you, I buried it. I buried it in the front yard. I mean, in the front yard. <laughs> well, 2026 is it's not that far away, man. You know, I don't want to even think about it. I don't even want to think about it. The schedule's no. insane. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. it's gonna be a wild one. That's gonna be a lot of. That's gonna be a lot of traveling. That's gonna be a lot of traveling. Um, but yeah, yeah, we book. We booked the Florida State LSU game over there in New Orleans. So if anybody's gonna be in New Orleans, make sure you come say hi. We'll do it. We'll, we'll figure out something. We'll we'll figure out a bar for all of us to go to in the Discord and everybody. We and book? If there's any listeners. We booked a hotel in New Orleans. We did. I'm rooming with Austin. Did so I not just set not that in the group chat yesterday? This man does not. I, read my know, I didn't. I didn't look this at man doesn't chat. message Ryan. Yeah, he doesn't check his messages. Um, but yeah, so we'll see y'all in New Orleans. Going to be a fun one. Uh, let's jump into some more stuff. Big time. I I think I said this on the show last week. I was waiting for Derek Kearney to go ahead and pop the commitment because he just, he's just he been on Florida State's campus more than I have, and I live here. Um, and it's pretty sad. But uh, big time, big time uh, offensive line target in the 2023 class. Roderick Kearney commits to Florida State and Coach Atkins. Mm-hmm. Felt this one coming for a very long time. I think after elite camp, I said, I feel like this is a lock. Just the way he and Atkins vibe together and they gel. 
I just felt like he was already a commit already. He goes to UF, which makes it even better. He goes and visits there and says, nah, that's just not going to work for me. I'm going with Coach Atkins. Nate, you got to love this pickup here. This is a true this is a true talented offensive lineman coming in and has a really bright future. He just looks yeah, it, apart. It, it, it's an exciting, uh, it's an exciting commitment for Florida state. You know, he's been a primary target for them for quite a while. Um, you know, for him to uh, have his location still in Gainesville and put out that, uh, commitment edit, you know, got to love to see it. But, um, I, I talking to him, I, I think what was surprising was that they're bringing him in as a center. Um, you know, he can play any position, and that's one thing that, you know, when we talked after he committed, you know, Coach Atkins is really pushing, you know, versatility with, with his with his players. You know, they got to be able to play multiple spots, if not all three. And, you know, the the, the services have him rated as a tackle, and that's fine. Um but he's an interior lineman, and his focus now moving forward is going to be playing center. So, you know, you, you have a guy who's 6'4", 3, 310, you know, that's a big center. And, and, and that's, so, that's, that's what FSU needs, man. You know, you know, he's smart, too. You know, he understands the game, and that's something that, you know, him and uh, Atkins have really clicked on it, it, it is – the film and understanding assignments and what his role is. So, you know, you know, Florida, you know, share some things, you know, in our group chat and on the, on the discord, you know, Florida really misplayed this, you know, they tried to make a run for him, but they did a really poor job. And, you know, the way they recruited him showed him while he was on the visit, why Florida state was the best option for him. So he knew while he was in, Gainesville, that a commitment was going to happen. So um, he shut it down. He's he's said it a few times now that he's locked in and you know, he's ready to go. Yeah, this is a huge grab for Florida State, and obviously Kearney instantly becomes the highest rated commitment in the class. The first offensive lineman that Coach Atkins has been able to grab so far in 2023 and he might have a chance at a second one here soon and lucas simmons but mm -hmm. with kearney i mean man this this kind of just felt inevitable um he's been a Tallahassee so many times over the last couple of months and you know he's just developed a relationship with coach atkins that's probably unlike any other coach that is dealing with him in his um recruitment and those two are just very closely connected and you could tell um, with some of his comments after visits that he was feeling Florida State pretty hard. And, you know, he he played us all a little bit earlier this month when he was saying, yeah, it's probably still going to come in December. And then bang, pops uh, a couple of days ago. And, yeah, it's just a, a really big grab for Florida State. And bringing him in at center, you know, he, he could instantly possibly get playing time as early as his true freshman season. Um, Caden Lyles will be gone. Marie Smith should still be should still be here. And mm -hmm. other than that, I mean, maybe Thomas Schrader or Kashawn Sapp could also be in that competition for the center battle. So mm -hmm. we'll just have to see. But I think he's gonna, he's a guy that's probably going to end up playing early in his career. And you're getting a hard worker. This is a, a guy who's already um, a champion in in some weightlifting meets. And you know, you can you can see it through his social media that he's been putting in a lot of work. And now it sounds like he's going to be putting on the recruiting hat as well for Florida state. So excited about this one. I do think that he maybe genuinely wanted to take a little bit of time, but you know, one of the big things for him was, was coaches keeping it real and keeping, you know, being honest with him and, you know, going on a visit like he did last weekend, you know, when, you know, coaches aren't necessarily, forthright i think he kind of knew that I, th I think that expedited the process you know because he you know said that you know he fought fsu and felt that it was maybe the, the spot for him but he was still iffy and wanted to check out some other schools mm -hmm. but I, I think that he had enough so yep no, I, I like i like the kid's work ethic i like the way he talks in interviews and i like too that he wants to be coached and everything doesn't have to be sweet 
throughout it. And I think he was one to come here and get developed by Coach Atkins. That depends on how long Coach Atkins is going to be in Tallahassee. But a lot of guys are relying on Atkins to be here for a while because they do want to be coached by him. So um, Should we get Curry's- him on the journal? Coach Atkins? No. Roger, let's get Curdy yeah, on, I mean, on the journal, man. That would be great. Might as well. I don't really think he's much of a journal guy, though. He seems really down to earth, nah. no BS, and just, nah. just wants to play football. Yep. Yeah, they get, yeah. No, the only one that we could do this with the next time <coughs> is probably uh, Lamont Green. That's probably going to be yeah. a Boots Jr. is what we'll have to have. But, um, yeah, really, really, really solid pickup. Being able to see him, at least we've seen him there for interviews, but whenever you see him out there competing and going through drills that is a very impressive young man to see in person very impressive uh demarco ward linebacker in the 2023 class decides to go with florida state and randy shannon out of georgia ward is 6'2, 205 and florida state definitely uh, with a big time need here at linebacker what are y'all's thoughts on this because i saw a little bittersweetness as usual from florida state twitter what are we uh what are we feeling about the pickup here? Um good has its ups, has its downs. What are we thinking? Uh, are, uh, is this a steal? Is this a steal? It's a linebacker. I think, I think that so, the, okay, you know, wow. I, I think that, you know, Florida State does a good job of, of evaluating talent. Um, you know, the staff, I know they get a lot of knocks on recruiting, and there's a lot of stuff that you can you know debate, you know, have a legitimate debate about. <clears throat> Excuse me, but and I, I understand, you know, the, the question is taking a kid who, you know, has some, you know, G5 offers or whatever you want to call them. Um, but they saw something they like. Um, you know, he's a sideline to sideline guy. You know, he, he runs real well, um, a little stiff in some areas, but, you know, he's someone that can, you put him with, you know, you know, Steve and I were talking, and he made a good point. You put him with a Kalen Deloach or Omar Graham, I think that's that helps him. Um, you know, he has the build to get to 230. Um, you know, what you see on on his highlight films, you see a smart player, not afraid to get in there and, and get the job done. So, you know, at worst, you, you, you got a special teams guy. But, you know, the linebacker board itself is highly debatable. You know, we, we've discussed it a lot here, but I, I'm okay with the take. Yeah, and it really shouldn't come as a surprise after how fast um, Ward and Florida State pushed to get that official visit set up. I think mm-hmm. it was less than a week before he made the trip. They they got that all set in stone, and then they were able to host him and his family on campus for two days where he was around the coaching staff in person and some of the other visitors and – Coming out of the trip, just mentioned that he enjoyed being around Coach Shannon and, and Coach Rodriguez and that Florida State did a good job of telling him where he'll eventually fit in on the defense, which they basically like his versatility and they think he can play multiple spots at linebacker and that's just something they're going to mm. continue to further further evaluate once he gets on campus. But, you know, you look at his recruitment, Florida State, the only official visit that he ended up taking before his decision and coming out of the trip, he announced that he'd be committing, I think it was a day after he had left Tallahassee. So it was a little telling. Um, and yeah, you know, this is the first first high school linebacker that Randy Shannon has landed, and we'll see how it pans out from here. Obviously, that board has been a little scarce to this point, but mm-hmm. I think getting Ward is a good start, and he's a candidate to, to be a riser in the rankings throughout his senior season. And I, I also think that like defensive line last year, it wasn't a um, a great class. I don't think it's a great class for linebackers this year. So while FSU has a need for linebackers, I also don't think it's a great year for linebackers. And you, you can do you can do worse than you know getting a kid from from Georgia, you know, with a chip on their shoulder. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm 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 good with it. Yeah, and with the way the defense is four two five primarily, you're probably not looking to take more than maybe one, two more linebackers max mm-hmm. alongside Ward in this class. I think I think Bethune is the only rotational guy that'll be graduating after the fall. So 
there's still a lot of uh, youth and talent that Florida State will have in that room for the coming years. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and then Flo- and Florida State still thinks they have a good shot at Nicholson, so we'll see what happens there. And he's coming off his Oregon visit. He's been to Oregon several times. Um, hey, as long we'll as see he, how that plays out. Yeah, I was going to say as long as he doesn't commit in the next two weeks. You know, coming off that post visit high to Oregon, a school he's been to so many different times, Florida State's going to have a real chance in that battle. It's going to be important to get him back on campus in the fall if they can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they've all, they've also been in touch with him since. So you know, he's told me a couple times that. If the visit goes well, he'll he'll be in Tallahassee for a game in the fall. So, we'll, you know, Dustin said if it happens, you know, we'll see what happens from there. West Coast Knowles, baby. <laughs> hey. Bring it back. Shout <laughs> out. Fact. Shout out, Jane Woodby. Shout out. Come on now. Shout him out. Shout out, Jane Woodby. All right, no shout outs for, for Jane Woodby. For, for <laughs> uh, Florida State just recently <laughs> wrapped up a big time recruiting weekend. Dustin was out there in full effect for it all, but this ended up being a pretty good, uh, starting off good, but it, it seems like it could finish off even better. Uh, wrapping up with eight official visitors in Tallahassee and Mike Norvell and the rest of the staff. They had on Chris Parson, Dalen Smothers, Samuel Singleton, too. Really impressive running backs there. You had Lucas Simmons, the Sweden guy that Florida State seems to be in a pretty good mix for. Lucas Simmons, Keldrick Falk, defensive end, Tavion Gadsden. You had DeMarco Ward, who, as we know, just talked about committed to Florida State, and then defensive back Avery Stewart. Gentlemen, first thoughts after this big-time recruiting weekend. They got they were able to grab one more of them. How many more out of these names are they going to be able to grab? All of them but some others. I think it's legitimate. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. It is. I mean, it is legitimate with the vibes coming out of the weekend. But yeah. I mean, if they but were the able long, to land, yeah, the longer it goes, we'll you know we'll see you know come off the visit high. But you know, Smothers is, is Oklahoma bound. It seems like yeah. Um, you know, Singleton's always been quiet with his recruitment, but Florida State's always been mentioned with him, and you know he had a great visit. Um, you know, Lucas Simmons did, I think, a hell of an interview with with um, with the with the guys outside of the Moore Center. I, I think what what he had to say, I think, bodes well for FSU. We had to call him actually. <clears throat> he didn't he didn't interview. Oh, well, okay. Well, the call, whatever. You know. So you can say all, my my interview that I did with Lucas Simmons was pretty good. Yeah, you can well, go ahead all the that. interviews were good. You know, look I at mean, that. So you got all your recognition. Make sure you give Dustin all of his recognition yep. right now that he did. Great, great job thing. being out there, by, by the way. I know it, it's a big weekend and it's hard work sitting out there for, you know, 12 hours. It's not easy. You know, good job. Now, um, now, so now, please stop burn. the night. Nice. Um, but anyway, please stop but, the niceness. That was too um, much. You know, too much. I, I, you know, I think Stewart is a little, you know, maybe. The borderline where you may not may not get him, but uh, you know, Falk, I think Florida State feels pretty good on. You know, you never you're not going to go 100, percent but Florida State has a legitimate legitimate chance to land all of them except for Smothers. I, I, I don't know if you agree with me, Dustin or Austin. What do you Austin? What do you think of uh, <laughs> of Coach Falk as, as as a recruit? <laughs> <laughs> He's not here. He wasn't here with us. (laughs) Thinking about life. I do agree with you, Nate. It just it just seems crazy to say because I think like four to six weeks ago we were just talking about how Florida State had no momentum on the recruiting (laughs) trail, and you know then since then this month at least you've you've landed four commitments and you've positioned yourself well with some of the top targets Mm -hmm. on the board at, at certain positions, and you know with this one. I really feel like Singleton. You've got to be. You've, you've got to be feeling good about. Um, you know, he was a guy that didn't want to make a decision until after his season. And coming out of the trip, he said that the visit to Florida State was so good that he's rethinking those plans and might decide sooner rather mm-hmm. than later. And it sounds like two other contenders in that recruitment are Penn State and LSU. Um, if Florida State gets the last visit before he commits, which it sounds like they very well might, you, I feel good about their chances there. 
Um, same thing with Lucas Simmons. Uh, he, he said he mm-hmm. plans to decide. We we did the interview on Sunday, and he said he planned to decide one to two weeks from then. So we're getting closer to that range. I traded a couple messages with him today, and he said that he's he's slowly getting closer to a decision, doesn't have an official date for his announcement just yet, but that'll probably come in the near future. And the three real contenders there, in my opinion, at least, Florida State, Florida, and USC, those are the only three trips that his mom mm-hmm. and dad were both on. And I've said it before, I'm a big proponent of the school that gets the last visit and a lot of these recruitments where the decision comes so soon afterwards. So mm-hmm. Florida State definitely has the momentum there. Um, Kel- Keldrick Falk set the side on July 5th, I believe. That one's FSU, Auburn, Clemson. You got the last visit. He was he was hugging Mike Norvell um, at one point and has a really good relationship with JP. He got to speak to some of the players this weekend. And really, just learn more about Florida State and mm-hmm. you know they they expressed the same thing that he already knew how real the coaching staff is. So, I mean, FSU has a chance there. You mentioned Avery Stewart. He's deciding on July 6th. That one's yep. a Florida State and Kentucky battle. Mm-hmm. He got the last visit. Um, Tavian Gadsden, it seems like I, – I think I already put in a prediction for him in our Discord, but it seems like he's another guy that will probably decide soon. And Florida State growing momentum over the Georgia Bulldogs at the moment. And I think we mentioned some others. He's probably going to end up at OU, it seems like. Mm. But – Florida State did all they could on this official visit to impress him and his parents, and they're just going to come up a little short, and it's crazy. You look over at the running backs that Oklahoma signed, I believe he's either the fourth or fifth running back commit in the last two classes for them. So OU mm-hmm. just stacking it talent on talent. No, DeMarco Murray is one of the best running back coaches in the country. Yeah, yeah. and Chris Parson. Oh, sorry. Chris, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, I just went. This randomly just came up on my tweet deck, but Cooper Williams uh, just retweeted Dalen Smothers. Uh, where should I land tweet just now? Uh, Cooper Williams, as we do know, is a assistant offensive line coach for Florida State. Just, just retweeted out of nowhere. I don't know if he's listening into the show right now and maybe, maybe showing us a little sign of something here, but he just retweeted that on his account just now. Cooper Williams did. Anyways, so just thanks for following that. the retweets. Anyway. Um, Chris I'm doing Parson, your job, doing your job. Chris Parson was the only official visitor not to interview on the trip, but he did spend a lot of time, spend a lot of time around uh, Tokars, Norvell. Obviously, his family accompanied him throughout the trip. And then shortly after he left Tallahassee, he went up to Los Angeles for the Elite 11. And I think we posted the comments on our website earlier today, but he spoke with some of the reporters in attendance after day one and just went into detail on his commitment to Florida state and some of the visits that he's taken throughout June. And, you know, just said he still saw with the Seminoles and I can pull up some of these quotes. Let's say something. Falk is awesome. The way that he can move his arms and hips really fast (laughs) is really good for a football team on the defensive side. (laughs) And he has really long wingspan. Okay, so going back to going back to Parson real quick, you know, he just got asked about the Mississippi State visit he took, and his comment was they have a really good staff in Mississippi State, but they all understand that I'm committed to Florida State and that I'm a Seminole. And he was asked if his recruitment is shut down after taking an unofficial <laughs> visit to Mississippi State, um, an official visit to SMU, and then an official visit to Florida State to cap off the month. And he said, I mean, you know, like I said, I wanted to be at Florida state. I'm committed to Florida state. I've been committed there for a very long time. It's always been my dream school ever since I was a kid, way before Jameis Winston, Florida state is where I want to be. That's where I want to play. So it seemed like he's been pretty clear with his comments about where things stand with Florida state right now. And that's just something we'll have to continue mon- continue to monitor Moving forward, it looks like he's put himself in a, a pretty solid outing at the Elite 11 Finals last couple of days. Well, I hope Florida State holds on to him because I think that his game is a fit for, you know, what what, what the call what college get you know is about stretching the field, you know, either with your feet or, or your arm, you know, putting stress on the defense, and I think he can do that really well. 
Um, you know, I know FSU wants two. You know, competition. You know, iron sharpens iron, and you know, like you said, he's out there competing with, you know, guys that FSU is targeting, and you know, purposefully trying to show who's better. So I, 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 I like that. Um, I hope he sticks because you know, he's been the bell cow and whatnot. So I mean, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. You know, Florida State's been honest with them. I think that you know. The visit was purposeful when it happened. I, I, I think Florida State knew they had to get him back on campus, making it make it an official and, and, and go from there. So we'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, so I don't see that just, going any other way right now. Yeah, no, I, I've, I've not been off that he's planning on a decommitment. <sighs> I mean, that's just not the vibe that I've been getting. I think there's definitely some things behind the scenes, and we've had multiple co- conversations. And you know, comments are being spammed, Logan. If you could, uh, oh yeah, that. there's some interesting stuff being commented here, right here. Let's go and get you this guy? naked HD XYZ, and I'm not going to say the rest. Definitely not going to say the rest on that. But that was our first time there. We're we have bots <laughs> with some interesting. Oh yeah, names. man. Good wow. stuff. Good stuff. Logan. Look at what are you doing on, on the uh I don't want to know what's going on in the YouTube account, guys. I want to look yeah. what I'm looking up, but no, I, I I think there's a lot of things behind the scenes and whatnot that, that that's going on, but the communication between Florida State and the Parson family has been on the same line there. And I don't think it's a good thing from Florida State's fan base to maybe push off a kid that I think, like Nate said, would work very, very well in and the offense that Mike Norvell runs and is talented and has a really high has a high ceiling. Um, and so I, I, I just don't see a decommitment happening. Well, the so the fan base is, is better after what happened with Travis Hunter and then Marvin Jones Jr. You know, do we have to say the fan base though? Because I mean, it's select people on Twitter. It's not the fan base. The, it's the, a couple shit. Heads, which everyone, everyone's got them. Yep. It all depends if you can block it out or not and just move on with it. But, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think I think things are going to be just okay, and you, you can't know, let you can't let those shitheads sway you. No, that's right. You got to you can be strong on the football field, but you got to be even better mentally. That's the quote of the day, right there. So we'll keep an eye on it. But I think after that official visit, um, I think that helped tone down a little, a couple things, and we'll jump and talk about it in a minute. But he's doing very well with the Elite Eleven competition right now out there in LA. Dustin, what do we have left on the docket for these official visits? Any last guys to? Any, anybody else on here that – Lucas Simmons, I feel like, could pop at any moment. Is that correct? Yeah, if, if you were paying attention earlier, I said that um, on Sunday he told me that he'd be committing within a week or two. So we're getting closer to that timeline. Damn. He doesn't have a firm date just yet, but he is drawing closer to a decision. And, I mean, Florida State's right there. They've been in this recruitment for the long haul. Alex Atkins obviously offered um, Simmons – whenever he was still in Sweden. And um, it does remind me, one of the interesting things they did on the visit. So a year ago, Lucas Simmons came to Tallahassee for Florida State's first mega camp. That was, it was either one of the first or the very first time that he had ever met Atkins in person and obviously worked with him on the football field as well. And during the visit this past weekend, Florida State showed him a video of that mega camp and how he was going through some of the drills and, wasn't necessarily doing everything correctly and then showed Atkins coming up, working with him, making the corrections and him going through um, the drills. Right. And, you know, from what he told me that has put everything into perspective with him for how long Florida state has been there and how much he's grown since then and how they were there from the very beginning. And I think that meant a lot to Lucas Um, that relationship with coach Atkins is, probably one of the very best in his entire recruitment. I mean, this is another one where Atkins has really blown it out of the park. And if they do land Simmons, this is a a true bonafide left tackle who already rated very highly on, you know, all of the recruiting websites and everything, but he's really just beginning to find that feel for his game and, and just beginning to unlock that potential. And I mean, he could legitimately be a first round NFL draft pick before it's all said and done. I mean, Florida State could have a lot of momentum here within 10 days with possibly Simmons and Stewart and Falk. You know, 
you know, the last two are making decisions here within the next five days. So mm-hmm. five, six days. So it's going to be interesting. And I think Gadsden could very well come in, in mm-hmm. the next month. Um, Samuel Singleton. It could be a very, a very fruitful July. You know, we're talking about four commitments in June. You might, you might get more than that in July and you're going into the football season with some real momentum on the recruiting trail. You come out strong out of the gate. You position yourself well with some of those top targets who are going to be committing um, later down the line. You know, guys like KJ Kirkland and there, there's plenty of others as well. Damn. And then now what the recruiting dead period is in place on July 25th. Does that end tonight? Or like the, or does the recruiting so dead the, the dead period went into place um Sunday at midnight and now it'll okay. be into effect until the final week of July. So basically Florida State will not be able to host anybody on campus, but they can still communicate on the phone and, and everything like that. So basically not going up to the Moore Center for a little bit, hopefully. I hope not. I hope not. Well, you better not, even if there's a need to, because that means, you know, <laughs> you know. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, 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 watch out there. Yikes. Taking a little summer vacation for before they kick off practice. And um, after the dead period, Florida State, they're planning to hold some sort of end of summer recruiting event mm-hmm. on July 30th. So that's notable. And, I'll be reaching out to guys, and I'm sure Nate will as well throughout the month to kind of formulate a little list. But I'm gonna I'm gonna come to that. That should be when we're starting to figure out when that should be around the same time Florida State's gonna arrange their beginning of fall camp. I yeah, I think it's gonna be a couple of days into camp. I would think. Yeah, because Florida State's, as we know, season starts in week zero, so we get to get things kicking a little bit earlier. So we've only we're less than a month now than than fall camp, less than two months. Overall, from kickoff, it's coming up in Tallahassee with Duquesne. So it's coming. It's coming quick. That was a busy month. That was a busy month, and this is the last day of it. And I'm honestly glad. VZ, you've been waiting all night for this. You've been waiting all no, night for this. Thought? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Give it. We need. We need the elite elevens. <laughs> elite eleven. Yeah, just give us the quickest. Let, let's good, skip it. Let, Parsons, I mean, Parsons doing good. Parsons um, did great. Glenn, we don't even know. Really yeah, one one matter. quick sentence on every quarterback. Yep, there you that go. Florida Glenn, State's involved with. Glenn has been up and down a little bit, and, and Collins has been real good with uh, um, accuracy drills. But you know, I think out of the three, it seems that Parsons has actually done better okay. overall. Well, I'm going to ban the comments again. We just got to ignore it. I don't know how many accounts. <laughs> it, I had to, I blocked them. There, there's more of them coming. Yeah, Parson oh, won the not, rail not. shot challenge on, I think it was Tuesday. And then Ricky Collins won a challenge last night. And Brock Glenn, he's... He's had some he's had some good performances and and also some down performances. So I'm not quite sure. Today was the last day of the event. They wrapped it up with kind of like a seven on seven type of competition between the quarterbacks. I'm not sure if they've named the final Elite Eleven because this was 20 quarterbacks competing for you know 11 spots to be named in this class of the Elite Eleven. They did announce the winner earlier, who was the Oklahoma kit, the Oklahoma commit. Nate, what was his name? Jackson Arnold. Jackson Arnold. So he won it, and not sure if they've released the rest of those spots yet. But Parson, it, I mean, it sounds like all three of them, or all three of those guys, have set themselves up well with a chance to make that team. So we'll see how it shakes out. Best of luck to them. Uh, let's jump into some basketball to finish it off because VZ's been waiting for this. You know, no players drafted in the NBA draft for the first time since 2018. Am I correct on that? Yep. Tough, tough scenes, tough scenes here, but Florida State's, you know, looking to get them some new guys. We, we put out a piece earlier this week um, regarding one guy, the sophomore on with Jalen Worley projected to go in the first round. So maybe, maybe that will change, but at least in this NBA draft, no Knowles uh, picked in the Really at all. <laughs> not in the first round. Not in the first round. I'm not trying to roast. Not I'm not trying all. to ro- I'm not trying to roast. I'm not trying to roast, but I'm just saying. It's the way not, you said it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, we got uh, football. We got first rounders going now. You know, Jermaine Jones. I mean, it's Thursday night was a long night for 
really for me because you know i was like i watched the whole thing too same i'm like if even if butler doesn't get drafted surely he'll get picked up you know pretty soon after the draft he was kind of on that borderline cost of being drafted and here we are a week later and he's still not signed not even a summer league bid not an ex- exhibition 10 contract not a two-way deal nothing um it's been really really silent regarding how bad is that advice horrendous just mm-hmm. absolutely terrible to the point where i've been told by a couple people he's fired his agency um i know that's not completely public knowledge but you know let it fly um that just sucks for the kid, you know, we, how many times have we talked about just the potential this kid has. And, you know, here we are two days from summer league starting for, you know, at least a few teams in California and he's still not a, on, not even on a summer league roster, much less, you know, European options, G league options, anything like that. Um, and I know Malik Osborne got a Cleveland Cavaliers summer league tryout. I know polites with the Spurs, um, and then Raekwon Evans just signed just signed over in Sweden today, but it's tough. I, I didn't. I did not think a week later, Raekwon Evans would have a team in Europe and John Butler would not have a team. <laughs> just, it's just it's the facts of the matter. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Um, tough. I don't think any. I don't think any of us could have uh, for foreseen this coming because I mean. I've been adamant. I didn't think John Butler was going to get drafted, but I did think mm-hmm. he was going to get a two way or, or something. And I mean, you know, he, he didn't have the best performance at the NBA combine. It's kind of unknown how he did during these personal workouts um, with different NBA teams throughout the last couple of, of weeks. But I mean, for it to, for it to be like this, it's, I'm, I'm it's sorry, very the, surprising. The guy's seven, one, 140 pounds. Um, uh, th- that's what I've heard is that the weight scared a lot yeah. of teams off, but to, to still not even have a tryout is insane. Um, I, I think there's kind of the, th- there's a rumor flowing out there that he got hurt before a workout that, that may be showing some, some substance now since he's not been signed on a week later. Um, he's definitely the biggest name that hasn't been signed. Um, and, and, and like Nate was mentioned, he's, he's 7'1", 174 pounds. I am 6'1", and 175 pounds. Like, you just <laughs> – you can't live at that weight at his size. You just can't. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, I'm very curious to see what the future holds for him. Um, I know uh, – Dustin mentioned his pre-draft workouts a little bit. There, I know there was one workout that he did not make it to, that him and his agent backed out of last minute. And once that happened, I kind of had a bad feeling that some's not going the way it's supposed to be going, whether it's injury, whether it's, you know, teams have been telling them you're not being drafted. So I, I really don't know. But it sucks for the kid. It really does because he has such a bright future ahead of him. I just think they rushed the process a little bit. He's made it infinitely, infinitely harder for himself than he really should have had to. Yeah, it's, it's an all-time bad decision, you know, because now – who knows where, where, or if he's going to land um, with an NBA team? And he had a chance to come back to Florida State, continue to grow his body, be in an even bigger role than he had as a true freshman. And I mean, instead, it's it's worst case scenario, probably even worse than he could have imagined. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, just it, insane. Yeah, you know, uh, I don't, I don't follow the basketball program like you do, Austin, but like. Do you ever see this kid making the NBA now? It's tough. I mean, slim to none, pretty much. I mean, it's definitely not impossible. I mean, because look mm-hmm. at guys like P.J. Tucker, who even as someone that was drafted, played in like six different countries before he ever got, you know, solid rotation yeah. minutes with the Suns in the mid-2010s. You know, Patrick Beverly, same way. Spent a lot of time overseas. So it's certainly possible. But, you know, P.J. Tucker and Patrick Beverly also wired a little bit differently than almost everybody else as guys that just do not play around. Those are two guys you do not want to mess with. Um, you know, again, Butler's half of P.J. Tucker's weight. So, I don't know. It, it, it'd be really, really difficult, but nothing's impossible in, in this day and age with basketball. Yeah. So, what, what's the path? Europe, G League? For someone like him... I think Europe would be better 
just so because you know Europe's all they were super used to these weird tall linky white kids you know and refining their skill sets they can do the same thing with a guy like John Butler who's a much better athlete than a lot of these people um I think that would be the better route just so you can refine a skill but you know the decision making process hasn't exactly been the best the last three months for him so who knows and I, I know a few people have asked it there's zero possibility of him going back to college it can't happen anymore yeah that that deadline passed weeks ago tough tough scenes there <laughs> mm. hurts fsu also hurts him so nobody won um, i mean does it really hurt fsu i mean because they moved on instantly to well, Bob miller who's just as talented could you have two babas it, john it, butler and, it, Baba? it, and in this situation <laughs> Baba? it was it was one or the other because you know the, yeah. the roster was finalized, then Butler goes pro, and they're like, okay, let's go get this Miller kid from, yeah. from Spain. I, mean, I it, think it Miller's better. In two weeks. I think I think Miller will be a better player for sure, whether he's better at Florida State. Well, I think he will be, but you never really know until he's actually playing and actually on campus too. True. And then Malik Osborne and Anthony Polite, they signed summer league deals. Which I wasn't too surprised about. Um the Malik Osborne deal was pretty much finalized the night of the draft. They just waited until the morning to announce it, um, which I'm not. I'm not surprised by that's. A, that's a guy that works really hard. I, I'm sure he impressed in a couple workouts. Um, good luck to both of them. You know, summer league's brutal, especially for guys coming out of Florida State system. That's such an unselfish system, and I have to go in the summer league where you kind of have to be selfish to show, hey, I can play at this level. It's gonna be kind of tough for them, but you know. They're certainly talented enough, and they have skill sets that the NBA can't get enough of right now as guys that can defend three, four positions, shoot the three really well. They can certainly make it. I wouldn't put it past them. Yeah, yeah I mean, the odds are definitely stacked up against them, but I think I think Malik ha- has a better chance and than maybe Polite if he can come back from that ankle injury, you know. But it's just tough to break it into, into the NBA when you're already 23 – 24 years old and, and they put so much behind potential and, and developing guys. And, you know, there's, there's this mantra that guys that have played in college basketball for three, four or five years, Oh, they've already peaked. They can't mm-hmm. continue to improve, which I think is kind of a lazy argument because, you know, most basketball players don't hit their prime until normally 27, 28. So. I, I think the, the biggest thing against them is Look at when they are, they'd be hitting their second contracts. Like a lot of these guys that are getting drafted, you know, in the, in the lottery, they're only 19, 20 years old right now. So by the time they hit that second contract, they're only 24, 25. Mm-hmm. And then by the time they hit that con- end of that contract, they're still 29, 30 with plenty of basketball left ahead of them. Mm-hmm. If you put that same argument with, you know, these older college basketball players who are 24, 25 under in the league, by the time they hit their second contract, they're already 30. So you don't have as much control over them for, the duration of the problem. I think that's more of where it comes from. Gotcha. Man, that's tough. And, and basketball, obviously we talked about Raquan Evans too. He's got an opportunity there in Europe, which i am learned through the years of you being on the podcast that pays pretty well. And you seem to be in some pretty good spots too. Oh, shit. I, I played the wrong sport. There's a lot worse places to be than Sweden. I'll say that. Yeah. No joke there. But then, FSU, I mean, it's a big time grab here at top 104 with Taylor Bowen. Uh, he's now the first one inside the 2023 uh, class to commit to Florida State. Pretty, pretty big pickup here for Leonard, Ham- Leonard Hamilton and Florida State. This is what's kind of what Florida State does, though. It just seems to be the above average guys that you're going to always be able to land, it seems like. I mean, yeah, just like we talked about last week, just prototypical Florida State guy lanky wiry super explosive athlete that can guard multiple multiple positions offensive game still growing but you know so has every other forward that florida state's got in the last four years um <laughs> he's gonna fit right in I, I really really like this pickup would have been great if he could have gotten his teammates to come with him but um you know we'll, we'll take one of the two for sure um bowen's definitely no slouch and it's a good start to the 23 class you know um for a while there looked like we were going to Get Anthony Robinson as well, but he just committed to Coach Gates and CY in Missouri. Stealing them. Snatched them right out of Florida high, right out of Florida State's nose. And, and, I'll go, and I'll go put a lock on the gym. I'll say, I know Dustin's upset out. about that one. 
Yeah, Dealey, what are you doing, man? Well, his, head coach is, his head coach is Charlie Ward. I mean, come on. What are we doing here? This is two straight Florida high kids, too. Yeah. Because he had, he had uh, was it Trey Donaldson? Yeah, last Trey year? Donaldson. Two straight. Where but from that side, it was more of the football staff. Yeah, but still. It, it, it was one of, I feel like in both situations, basketball kind of got into the recruitment a little bit late. Cause I didn't they just Definitely. offer Robinson like two weeks ago? Yep. So, like, in both situations, I think they just got into it too late. Yeah, I'm just – I mean, football side, basketball side. What are we doing with the local recruiting, man? I, know, I mean, Raylan. they're they're right down the street. They're right in your backyard. Raylan Wilson. Like you said, Robinson has got the offer. You know, Florida State, they kind of were hot and cold on, on Keon Brown. Yeah, you mentioned Raylan Wilson. But, I mean, even – Cameron Upshaw, and I mean, it goes back the last couple of years. For some reason, the talent that's right around the university not getting a lot of looks, and when they do get a look, it's it's too late because some national power has already showed them the interest that they wanted from their hometown school. So, well, it's a little frustrating. Randall, Randall Wilson's not not quite over yet. What are we? I don't think you know. I think Florida State's fully out of Wilson. I don't think I, don't, I heard some rumblings. I was on a show last night with uh, with one of our friends, James Coleman, and said it's not fully over yet for Florida State's relationship with Raylan Wilson. So we'll see. That's the nope. linebacker that just decommitted from Michigan. So he goes to school at Lincoln here in town. But uh, yeah, no Florida State missing. I mean, Charlie Ward. What are we doing? We gotta get Charlie back on here. We gotta. We gotta. They did get that long snapper though from. Huge, like Charles, right? Tighten, tighten up, tighten up, Charlie, man. Come on, bro. <laughs> tighten up. What? They're not talking about me, right? No, I'm talking about Charlie Ward. Needs to tighten up. Oh, okay, okay. I didn't know. No, I don't. I don't. I don't have a lot of work with at a at a, at a Charles to use my like <laughs> tactics to get them to land at FSU. J- Dustin has quite a few over there at Florida High, but he should he shouldn't be at the Moore anymore. He needs to be over there at his old campus. It's on stomping grounds. Apparently, the Florida State coaching staff needs to go over there before two weeks ago. <laughs> it, it was it was because we'd heard from a couple of people with Robinson that once they offered, they're all over him because he'd, he'd had a really good AAU circuit. Coaches were hot on him. I think he had a good um, – because Florida State just hosted, hosted their team camp a couple weeks ago too. and I heard he put a couple good performances there. So as long as those, once they were on him, they were on him. I just think it was too late. <laughs> One last thing here from Tom on Facebook. Our guy is asking if Ham, Coach Ham, has a bad season. Is he on the hot seat? I, yeah, I have a take on this too. I, how do I put this? You would think no. Just I, th- I think Ham at this point deserves to go out how he wants to go out. But at the same time, we've seen Alford does not play. <laughs> Yeah, and he's going to do whatever it takes to make Florida State a winning environment at every single sport, not just football. He's going to go get the best option, and, you know. And we also have to consider like what what are we what are we talking about with a bad season? Are we talking about you know on the bubble barely missed a tournament? Are we talking completely bottom out, which I don't think is going to happen, barring another injury riddled season like last year. You know, I, I think this is a team that's you know top five, top six in the ACC, as long as they stay healthy. They've certainly got the talent, certainly have – they have better shooting than last year, which is important. Um, we'll, we'll get in that uh, in a couple months. Mm-hmm. Well, well, for, for me, bottom out would be like 12 wins, right? You know? Yeah, like like going like like 12 and 21. I, I, like I, don't, I, I don't see with the talent on, 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 the, on the roster that, you know, it would be that bad. I agree. Unless your top eight players are out for the year. It's kind of like last year where it's a lot of inexperience with guys that you're going to rely on. But hopefully they start to gel by, by January. I know we kept saying this all last year. Just give them time. Just give them time. They never got that time last year because everyone was hurt. <laughs> you know, hopefully this year they have that chance to gel and play together in, in normal games. You know, that that's going to be a huge factor. And, you know, there's that big tournament in Orlando with a lot of good teams down there. Let's let's say, have a chance to prove himself. Let's say that was my first time being down there during basketball season uh, in the in the press box, Austin. So maybe I need to remove myself from 
the press area and not be down there to cover you did you, was... you quit going to games <laughs> well i didn't <laughs> no i didn't really quit but yeah, I, you, up there. Kind of, nah, I can't they, drink they a beer a couple games in a row and you're like i can't eh, i'm not going I, I can't drink a beer at the press box i can't do that sadly that's just not really permitted i don't know if it's against the rules really though but i don't think it's really a professional so i'd go and you offer the tickets up there and i go sit up there with you and Maddox goes down there and, and cover covers it. So, but I do take so a little bit of the blame. So then I uh, ultimately going. just quit going and would just drink at home. So yeah, that's what I did. Uh, anyways, hopefully Leonard turns things around. We love Leonard Hamilton. Um, but yeah, coach Alford is not playing. Coach, coach Alford. Coach. <laughs> <laughs> he practically is now. I mean, damn ripping everybody's, Give me your damn contract. Get out of here right now. You think you're worth more than this. Get the F out. Congrats uh, about uh, the I, I baseball mean, team, though. Picked up big time uh, links there from Notre Dame. Yep. That's a big time I, I, grab. You know, if, it, you know, if the football season goes sideways, nah. it, 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 it does make me feel a little bit more comfortable, you know, with the hires he's made that, you know, the, the right hire would be, you know, he's decided set, yeah. on and would be. He's, he's gotten pretty much every – number one option so far mm -hmm. you know obviously it would have been great to keep coach Corian with soccer but you know I, I feel like he rebounded pretty well on that hire link Jarrett was a phenomenal hire i think coach mm -hmm. wyckoff with with women's basketball was the right move um, soccer coach that's what i mentioned first um <laughs> i had another name as you could as you can tell nobody on this podcast listens to one another at all he, he held on he held on to lonnie <laughs> Over that push, yeah, from Texas, right. Right. Texas A and M tried to get him, yeah. tried to get her. Was huge. So <laughs> I don't. I I was just saying things too, way too fast there. <laughs> Alfred to really does not. Do. Alfred, we, Alfred does not play around, and he's he's no. got a history of being the alpha dog, no matter where he's been, and he's going to get his way. And I think that's that's big because we've kind of had a push over the last few years. I'm okay with that. I am too. Me too. Me too. Anyways, I think that's going to wrap it up. This was definitely a long episode. Definitely appreciate Marvin Bracey hopping on here with us. Best of luck to him competing in the 100-meter world championship representing the United States. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for that race. I'll be definitely tuned into that. I think with the, the kind of – if he gets a good heat and he gets a good get off, man, I, I feel like that's a podium. If not, man, I'd kill for him to get like silver gold. Ooh, that'd be that'd be badass. I feel like you looked up here. track synonyms before this episode and are just throwing out – I ran. I gear. ran. I competed in track, asshole. I competed in track, so that's, that's kind of – I know the lingo a little bit, so – Anyways, um, Dilu, I also saw Dilu at the gym today, Nate. He's putting in putting in some work there. He's putting in some work. It was Play weird seeing it. Okay, you don't have to say now which gym I also go to. Planet Fitness on uh, North Monroe Street <laughs> next to... Family all right, everybody, Stadium let's play. wrap up the show. I hope you all have a great rest of y'all's weekend. Logan goes about July 12 to 4th. 2 p.m. God, Jesus Christ. Um Please don't show up. And... You want an autograph? He'll be there wearing some stupid hat. So, but but he will have wristbands to give out. I will have wristbands, and I like doing autographs in the bathrooms. Anyways, uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your weekend. Enjoy July fourth, and we will talk to you guys next week. Adios, guys. Appreciate it. You're right. Cut that out, dude. That's.